Hello, welcome to my rock and fossil collection. My name is Peter Brummel and I'm your host today on Paleo Logos. We are going to be looking at some various interesting specimens that I have and I'm delighted to have the chance to show you around. So thanks for being here today. Over the years I've collected some rocks and fossils but about four years ago, I expanded my collection by purchasing the, the geology department of a nearby college that went bankrupt. And so we have lots of rocks and fossils around our house now. This table here represents some of the finer mineral specimens in our collection. And these drawers are filled with all different types of minerals. So for example, this is the hectosilicates jaw, and it's silicate minerals. Um, mostly this jaw is different quartzes. Now quartz is the second most common mineral in the world and it comes in lots of different varieties. So all these different varieties have the same chemical formula but they're dyed differently by the elements that uh, are impurities inside of these quartz. So for this example it's a uh, rose quartz. It has this nice pink hue to it. This is amethyst and scientists have found out that amethyst actually has iron in it which gives it this nice uh, lilac color. There's also things like this green quartz and then there's also um, flint. That's a type of quartz, and of course it's the material that we recognize Indians as using for arrowheads. Most commonly you'll see like agates, those are quartz agates. So quartz is a very common mineral and it comes in lots of different forms and shapes and sizes. Now up here I have um, kind of like a catalog of lots of different types of minerals all laid out here. They each have their own individual uh, little flat like this and you can see there's a mineral and its catalog number and its name and they're all kind of organized here in different uh, organization schemes. These plastic bags that you see here are encasing some of the dangerous minerals like asbestos. Way down here, I have various different types of mica. Mica is this very flat mineral. Sometimes in the past people would use it too. And this type is called muscovite after an area in Russia. And it has this nice glossy metallic sheen to it. But what's interesting is that it grows in these large flat flakes. So if you wanted to, which I don't want to because this is a nice specimen, but you could pull these flakes apart from each other and there's each these little paper thin layers and each of them is a crystal. There's also another type uh, that's called biotite. You can see it's pretty black compared to that last um, muscovite. And then there's this one which has a lot of potassium in it and it's a kind of purplish color. It's a pretty one. Further down here, uh, I've got the most common mineral in the world, which is feldspar. And once again, feldspar comes in lots of different varieties. Um, this is a very pretty variety called perthite. You can see this beautiful green color to it. And it will sometimes form in these uh, nice crystals like I've got here. Feldspar, once again, we have blue crystals. Uh, orange, pinkish crystals, but most commonly it's kind of this white, uh, kind of chalky feeling rock. And feldspar would make up lots of things like granite. So there's three different types of rock that I just showed you. The quartz, the, uh, the micas, and the feldspar all come together in a rock to make up granite, which is why granite has different colors to it. If you've got a piece of White granite, the white is a mix of quartz and feldspar and the black dots in it are pieces of muscovite. 
So we have elements which combine to make minerals and then minerals combine and crystallize to make rocks. Up here I've got some interesting specimens. This is a large piece of corundum. It's the same material from which rubies and sapphires come and it can once again be dyed naturally by the impurities in it to become red or blue. This is gem quality corundum because it's not clear and so when it's clouded it's called corundum and when it's colored and see-through then you would call it a ruby or a sapphire. This is a piece of halite here. It's more commonly known as rock salt because this is literally the stuff that we will put on our food. We can find it in large deposits in the ground where it appears that ancient lakes may have evaporated and left behind large salt deposits which uh, miners can mine and grind up to make salt. Let me show you something interesting about salt. Salt has this unique uh, feature that's called cleavage and some minerals have it, some don't. Quartz doesn't have cleavage and cleavage tells you how a mineral breaks. For example, I hit this piece of halite with a hammer and you would expect it to just fall apart in a bunch of nobular pieces but instead it broke in all these uh, pieces with all these right angles. You can see here all these flat sides come to form these right angles which fit together very nicely and that's because of the internal structure of the halite. Interestingly the chemicals which make up halite are on a an molecular level actually cube shaped and so the little tiny cube shaped molecules come together to form a larger cube shaped uh, chunk of mineral which when broken breaks along these planes of easy division on these flat sides. In this drawer here I have some coal and amber. They're often found in deposits where they're mixed together. There's a couple of different various basic types of coal. One of those is lignite and this is a very um, weakly pressed coal. It appears that lignite hasn't been under the same pressure and heat as other types of coal have been and so it hasn't had time to actually solidify and uh, decay as much as these other types. Like back here, um, I've got here bituminous coal. You can see it's, it's more shiny than this dull coal over here and that's because as it's been pressed and exposed to high temperatures, it's become more pure carbon. And carbon, of course, is the part of the coal which burns. And so the higher carbon content in coal, the better it burns. And so bituminous is would be a common type of coal to burn, whereas we would rarely ever burn lignite because it has little carbon content compared to bituminous. But it gets uh, even better back here I have a piece of anthracite and anthracite is even more hardly pressed coal. So I think it's around 90 percent carbon content by this time and it gets very shiny and very glossy you can see as a result of all that pressure and temperature. Down here I have an interesting group of minerals and these include things like galena which is an ore of lead. So galena is very heavy as a result. It feels quite heavy in the hand and it is the major ore of lead. Over here I have calaverite and for such a small specimen this is very heavy and the reason it's so heavy is that it is actually one-third gold. Here I've got uh, pyrite. This is also known as fool's gold. And in this specimen you can see all these uh, individual cubic pyrite crystals grown into each other to create these kind of uh, balls of this golden-like material. All the way down here at the bottom I've got some stalactites and stalagmites 
And so these are, of course, the iconic uh, minerals found in caves. They're more technically known as dripstone because they form, of course, when water drips. And they form very commonly in limestone caves. And the reason is that limestone is CaCO3. And so it has the minerals in it to produce uh, calcium, or sorry, calcite, which uh, these are basically pure calcite. And so as the water drips down, it's slightly acidic and it tears apart the limestone molecules and rearranges them to make these calcite structures. This is a unique specimen because you can see the rings of growth on it, just like you would expect from a tree. And so you can see how over time, as this stalactite grew and water kept running down it, there's these different rings of growth. This is a unique specimen. It is this malachite um, dripstone. It's this long piece of this copper mineral. And so that's a little bit of a rarer type of stalactite that you wouldn't expect to find as normally as, say, calcite dripstone. This is a cool piece as well. I think it looks a little bit like popcorn, all these fluffy white looking structures. And it is actually quite hard. It's also a calcite dripstone. Up here I have on this uh, counter some fluorite. And it's actually a lot of these different rocks. This is fluorite. All these ones over here are the same mineral, once again, dyed in lots of different colors. And this particular specimen is very striking for its vivid blue color. It's uh, very pretty. But fluorite can also be found, you can see, in this darker blue, um, often in purple. And in this specimen, we can see a cube right out of the rock here and turns out that fluorite will actually grow in a cubic crystal formation. So we can uh, find natural fluorite crystals that come out of the ground in a cube shape like this one. And in larger specimens like this one over here, we can see a whole bunch of different cubes all intergrown into this one big block of fluorite. Now, fluorite also has another special property, which I'll show you right over here with my ultraviolet light. We're now going to look at some minerals that fluoresce. And fluorescing is a term which means that when a mineral is impacted by a high energy light, it itself gets excited and the electrons begin vibrating and that the mineral itself will actually release a visible form of light. So I have here an ultraviolet light and it gives us this normal purple color and certain things will fluoresce and so when you I point it at these rocks in the dark in a moment you'll see how they vividly this is a specimen of willamite a rare mineral that's only found in one place on earth Franklin New Jersey you can see that when you shine this ultraviolet light on it, it gives off this beautiful green color. Now, not only natural things do this, but also artificial things. Like you can see my shirt, laundry detergent fluoresces blue, and so your socks and you know, my shirt here will fluoresce. Some rocks like calcite right here you can see have this beautiful orange coloration. Fluorite, as I was just talking to you about over there, has a brilliant blue color. And fluorescence, um, this phenomena of this light being emitted from this mineral, was actually named after this mineral because it was first observed in this mineral that this could happen. And it's very interesting that you can uh, see this. This is one of my favorite specimens. You can see these bright red bands in this rock and as I turn it around you can follow this sclerite through this specimen. It just has a very beautiful red color. And this piece of aragonite here has this 
nice pink color you can see. Now I have done some fluorescent mineral collecting myself. This is one of the specimens that I collected and you can see here it has this greenish color on the side there. And now I'll turn the lights back on. If you have any questions, feel free to comment below. Thanks for joining Paleo Logos today and have a good rest of your day.